Hello, everyone. My name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on the introduction to AFC system testing. Uh, a few administrative notes before we get started. Uh, the slides presented during this webinar are going to be posted uh, here at wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars, and I believe a copy will be sent out to everyone who attends or everyone who registered. Uh, the recorded webinar will be available on the WinForms YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it at youtube.com slash c slash the wireless innovation forum. And again, if anyone needs any, uh, any help finding any of the materials that are being presented today, please send me an email at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. And uh, I will either respond to it directly or forward it on to the appropriate person, whoever that might be uh, from the panel. Uh, for questions today, we'll do questions at the end of each section. Uh, during the uh, session sections, please uh, type your questions into the questions window on your interface, and uh, I will review those and moderate them and, and pass them on to the presenters when they get to uh, the end of each section. Uh, there will also be a general question and answer section at the end of the webinar, and so if you have uh, some overall questions, feel free to submit them. And like I said, I will I will uh, present those to the panelists as we go. Uh, so before we get started, uh, we wanted to get some opening remarks from the leadership of the uh, two uh, associations that have, were responsible for producing the materials you're going to see today. Uh, Alex Royblatt, who's the Vice President of Worldwide Regulation, Regulatory Affairs from the Wi-Fi Alliance and Mark Gibson, who's the Director of Business Development of Comscope and the President and Chair of the Wireless Innovation Forum. So Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Lee, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as we're coming up on the third year anniversary uh, of the FCC decision to open up the six gigahertz band for unlicensed use, we're realizing that this decision uh, was transformative uh, to the Wi-Fi technology, but even more importantly, this decision is improving connectivity for billions of people around the world. Uh, in fact, in the last three years uh, since the decision, over 60 countries have authorized unlicensed use of the 6 gigahertz band. Uh, the integral part of the FCC decision, namely standard power devices controlled by AFC system, offer enhanced performance which is achievable with increased power limits and thereby represent an important segment to the enterprise as well as consumer market. And that is why our industry collectively stepped up to facilitate enablement of the six gigahertz standard power operation. Wi-Fi Alliance in collaboration with WinForum invested significant resources, thousands of man hours to develop a suite of specifications that we'll, we will share with you today. Uh, these specifications are already enabling development of a vibrant 6 gigahertz AFC ecosystem. And I'm confident uh, that the information that we share uh, with, will assist regulators and other interested parties in validating AFC capabilities and functionality. So I look forward to the webinar and, and leave back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Mark? Uh, thanks, Lee, and thanks, Alex. And uh, I would I would add just to what Alex said uh, that uh, the, what you are about to see for the next two hours represents a good two years of work on just the testing alone. And Alex is absolutely right, probably thousands of man hours. So it's a huge effort, and it's it's transformative in the industry. Um, Wi-Fi in this band uh, is transformative. Um, if you go to the Wi-Fi Alliance website, they're predicting billions of devices will be deployed in the next few years. Many of which, many of which will be under control of the AFC. Um, so we're really working hard to get this right out of the box. Um, in the wind form, we've got lots of experience from the past with CBRS, with TV white space, and other sort of uh, very similar process approaches. And so um, I don't want to take too much time. Without a further ado, I'd just like to thank everybody that, uh, on today's uh, webinar, the, the folks that are going to be presenting. You basically have the brain trust from both organizations that have been focusing on uh, the test and certification. Um, and so, and as Lee will uh, address uh, the questions and everything as they come up. Uh, and so, um, I just want to thank everybody for all the work they've done on it. And I will turn it back to Lee. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. 
So what are we going to be presenting today? Uh, this slide shows a document flow, and we'll be referring to this throughout the webinar. Um, we'll start with an overview of the requirements for AFC systems, and those are captured in the Wireless Innovation Forum's TS-1014 document. Uh, next, we'll go into an overview of the AFC interface specification. This basically defines communications between the AFC system and the AFC device, and is also the communications path that's used for testing. Uh, we'll go, and that was created by the Wi-Fi Alliance. Then we'll go into the Wi-Fi Alliance AFC system compliance test plan, uh, which basically defines which tests need to be run. Uh, an overview of the test vectors and the test vector responses from the Wi-Fi Alliance. Those will be uh, showing how the, um, the how the system will be exercised to prove that it meets with the requirements defined in TS-1014. The traceability between those, uh, tracing the requirements to the actual test, is captured in a uh, traceability matrix that the Wireless Innovation Forum has produced, and we'll be presenting that. And then we'll go into the actual test harness and how it works and how it can exercise an AFC system under test and how uh, the, the whole thing comes together to, pr to produce a test report that can be uh, generated showing compliance with the requirements as they've been provided. So that's the flow of uh, documents that we're going to be presenting today, documents and tools that we're going to be presenting today. Uh, the speakers, and you should be able to see them on your screen, uh, are shown here. So we, we've got a pretty wide array of speakers from both the Wireless Innovation Forum and the Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, Richard Bernhardt, who's with WISPA, will, will give an introduction to the requirements. Thomas Durnham from Broadcom will give an overview of the AFC interface specification. Tevik Yusik from Qualcomm will talk about the system under test plan. Stuart Strickland from Hewlett Packard Enterprise will talk about the uh, test vectors and test vector responses. Masood Alfat from Federated Wireless will present the uh, AFC system requirements traceability matrix. And then finally, to wrap up, Andy Clegg and Austin Egbert, uh, Andy Clegg from Google and Austin Egbert from Baylor University will present the uh, AFC system test harness, which will be used to uh, exercise the AFC system under test uh, during testing. So with that as introduction, oh, um, uh, one other thing, uh, we're going to be talking today exclusively about testing for compliance with uh, Wi-Fi specifications. Uh, the Wireless Innovation Forum has also developed a set of specifications to support 5G NRU and, and other interfaces. Uh, the uh, specification numbers are shown here. Uh, we're not going to be covering those today, uh, so if people have questions on those, please send me an email and I'll, I'll help you find the, the right references. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Richard Bernhardt, and Richard's going to give the uh, opening introduction to uh, WinFTS 1014 requirements. So uh, welcome, Richard. Lee. I appreciate the introduction and uh, the accurate statement that this is uh, nearly two and a half, two years of, of hard work by um, a very wide variety of companies, organizations, and stakeholders. The importance uh, today is in covering how the specifications pull everything together. Once the FCC has issued rules, um, the industry steps in and our organizations have tried to tie together. Uh, the rules with best practices and requirements that make chaos into organization. And that is what TS-1014 attempts to do. It is the AFC functional specifications. Next slide, please. So we want to begin with what the AFC system functional requirements are for and what they do. So uh, the AFC system itself is set up uh, between the operators and um, the database systems that the FCC has, which record the incumbents' uh, information um, in order to protect the incumbents from harmful interference. And um, unlike any other band at this point, this system um, has an organized set of operations which are guided by these specifications, as are the devices that um, are guided. So the first 
requirement that's set forth in 1014 is the requirement of registration of devices, the standard power devices for AFC systems. And this covers the 850 megahertz of spectrum that are used for the uh, standard power outdoor portion of the band. Um, AFC systems are not required for the low power indoor variety of the band, which covers 1200 megahertz of spectrums. The AFC system functional requirements also cover the operation of the AFC system itself throughout the six gigahertz environment and their purposing and direction in order to protect incumbents. And as noted, the main protection here is around the six gigahertz licensed portion of the band, which is predominantly point to point functionality, including critical functions and operations. So this is a shared band allowing for the benefit of the existing licensees and also um, the protection of uh, their interests while allowing for wide and broad coverage in the extension of the Wi-Fi bands and um, standard power devices in six gigahertz. Um, the requirements also cover the creation of the critically important test and certification procedures for the band in the ecosystem. This uh, sets forth how uh, devices will interact with each other, what requirements are done in order to certify them, and how the operation takes place. And many of you in the audience today will play a critical role in that function. The idea is to match up the regulatory requirements that are set forth by the FCC and U.S. codes um, with industry-driven uh, standards, and that's what TS-1014 does. And it creates an open and generalized environment that is not chaotic, hopefully for all of the operators in the band. Let's move on to the next slide, please. As the other speakers have noted, there has been a tremendous amount of effort put into this by and between not only um, the regulators in the band, but also as many as close to 200, organi uh, 200 individuals from 60 plus organizations. And that even extends out to a much larger number when you include all of the participants uh, in this process. So know that an awful lot of effort, um, experience, and not only one side of the point of view is, is represented in these specifications. Let's move on. There's a list of uh, many of the participants on this slide. So the scope of TS-1014, which is really critical, and its appendices are a technical specification to define the functional requirements of the following components. The AFC system itself, which is the automatic frequency control system, the AFC system operator, standard power access points and devices, fixed client devices and their proxies. Uh, proxies are not required, but if you want to use a proxy, it's covered in TS-1014, also known as a network device. Um, and to specify the necessary standards to enable tests and certification procedures for a properly functioning environment in the six gigahertz band. And you will find that the functional requirements in this band um, comport directly uh, with the federal communications rules as well as U.S. Title 47. Um, and it is a Part 15 band that we're talking about here in the unlicensed portion of the band. And uh, we'll go over in a little bit more the various aspects of how 1014 works uh, dealing with very direct correlations to the rules and also indirect portions of the rules. Let's move on to the next slide, please. In that respect, as you read through 1014, and I will warn you, it is a little bit of an in-depth document. There's quite a bit of detail in there. That is done so that you um, have the detail necessary to uniformly respond to the rules and to have a clean and clear hierarchy. Um, this is the hierarchy, so if you see terms like R0, R1, R2, or R3, there's a purpose to it as you read through 1014. R0 are requirements that, that directly map, we talked about traceability, they directly map to the FCC rules. And R1 is something that is derived directly from the FCC rules and the applicable FCC orders. R2s are the requirements imposed by the WIND forum uh, to meet the FCC rules, and R3s are the requirements imposed by the WIND Forum to meet industrial or industry type needs. In this webinar, we're only going to cover RO, R1, and R2. Let's move on to the next slide, please. 
AFC systems require um, and anticipate certain things. One is that they're going to be working with a standard power device. Uh, that can be an access point or a client device. And a standard power device or an SPD um, has registration parameters. So the AFC system requires those registration parameters to understand who and what it's communicating with. Um, SPD geolocation data, so it knows where um, the device is located in order to give accurate information about the availability of frequencies and power. And uh, the permissible use of domain proxy network devices as an intermediary for SPDs. SPD device, uh, critical to the function is the SPD device power and emission limitations. And then um, there is also a security aspect uh, listed in TS-1014 on both the device side and the, the AFC system side in order to assure that the devices are actually using a real AFC and the AFC is talking to a real certified device and of course the SPD interaction requirements with the AFC systems. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, and then uh, the functional requirements, I'm not gonna go through all of these uh, specifically, lay out the very specifics for validation and for system determination, system storage uh, information requirements, enforcement instructions, and all of the roles and requirements of AFC systems in protecting incumbents. This includes interference protection, fixed service protection and transceiver parameters, propagation modeling, um, and requirements and protection of including uh, passive sites. Also um, contemplated are radio astronomy and international border uh, protections. Final slide, please. All right, uh, on top of the technical specification, that's the TS, in 1014, the document also has additional annexes. These annexes um, are both normative and informative based upon which annex that you're taking a look at, and they provide additional uh, guidance and direction for specific topics. There is one for 3GPP specific features, one for IEEE um, 802.11ax specific features, uh, there's a reference table for fixed service receiver parameters and a couple of informative um, annexes around AFC operator certification procedure and data interpolation methods for fixed service receiver antenna and passive sites. And uh, we always track any revisions that we make to TS-1014. Um, this is a really critical do um, a document and hopefully functionally beneficial for your operations and your tests and certifications. So I'll toss it back to you, Lee. Thank you very much, and I will take any questions if there are any. Sure, so one question that came up is, um, you mentioned R3s, uh, R3 requirements. Uh, and will, they, will they be available at some point to discuss? Will we be following up on that later? The document itself contains the R3 uh, requirements, and R3 requirements are sort of an extension or a bridge between industry needs and the regulations. So they should never go beyond the regulations, the rules rather, um, but they provide a sort of an extension to allow for gap filling wherever there's a problem or an issue um, that might not be specifically stated by the FCC, but for which industry has agreed there's a good solution, they will show up in 1014. Okay, thanks Richard. I think that's all the time we have for questions right now, uh, but we can handle some more at the end. Uh, at this time then, I'd like to introduce Thomas Durham. Uh, Thomas is with Broadcom and he's going to give the overview of the Wi-Fi Alliance AFC interface specification. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Thomas. Great, thank you, Lee. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be here. So yeah, the next few slides, I'm going to go through an overview of the um, the interface specification defined by uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance between the AFC system and AFC device. Um, go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a kind of introduction. So um, this specification document is publicly available. I think the, the link is shown there. I think it's also in the annex at the end of all the decks. You can go and download it. Um, basically, it defines the transport, the signaling, and to some extent, the behavioral requirements um, 
for this interface between AFC system and AFC devices. So if we look at the um, figure on the right, that's the different possibilities of the blue line between the AFC system at the top and any one of the AFC devices. We've kind of got three different types. Um, there's standalone APs in the middle, probably possibly the most common one. There's um, a proxy on the left-hand side, which represents one or more non-standalone APs, which uh, kind of sit below it. And on the right, there's also um, fixed client devices, which are not APs, but can still interact directly with, uh, with an AFC system. So it's covering um, each of those three possibilities to interact with the AFC system. Next slide. OK, so this slide just describes the transport at a very high level. So it's, a, it's quite a simple interface kind of based on, you know, modern best practices for transport. So it's an HTTPS based API. Um, the AFC system is a server that's defined by a URL. So there's an example there, httpsafc.operator.com forward slash available spectrum inquiry. And that's the method which um, is basically used for this, um, for, 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 for this request. Um, there is so it's basic request and response protocol using HTTP POST, um, as I said, it's HTTPS or TLS, at least um, version 1.2 or higher is required for the um, security of uh, that, that link. And then in terms of the payload, so everything is, uh, is JSON format, so uh, we define the, uh, the message structure of those payloads and it also includes some fields that can be used for, for vendor extensions, I'll come on to in a bit. Next slide. Okay, so this um, slide is kind of discussing a little bit more details of the security of the um, uh, of, of the interface. So, because this is TLS based, that TLS establishment includes server certificate validation. So that's where the AFC device at the bottom on the uh, bottom box, uh, blue box on the right hand side, is uh, is validating the uh, certificate that the AFC system, AFC server, um, provides to it to make sure that that AFC device is connecting to um, the AFC server that it thinks it's connecting to and um, you know, it's protecting against it inadvertently connecting to some kind of rogue AFC server or any attacks on that link. So all of this assumes that um, the AFC device is securely configured with some trust basis. So there's two parts to that. One is the URL that I mentioned before and the other is a um, some kind of uh, root certificate trust basis, a CA root set. And then obviously the um, AFC server at the top is configured to host the same URL and it has um, public private key um, pair with a server certificate which is uh, signed by that, by that CA. Um, and the specification requires the device to validate the server certificate that the AFC server provides during that TLS establishment and to not connect if the validation fails. It's kind of, I guess, three main parts to that. One of them is strictly matching the host name of the AFC server against the um, host name in the URL that the um, AFC device has been configured with. Um, second part is validating the whole signing chain between the server certificate and the, um, the CA root set that's configured on it. And the third part is uh, verifying the, uh, the current certificate revocation status, for example, using uh, OCSP stapling, probably the most common way. So that kind of combination, um, making sure that that uh, validation happens, you know, um, make sure the device is connecting to the AFC server that it's uh, expected to be connected to. Exactly how the AFC device is configured with the URL and trust basis, we don't um, define. It might be kind of hard coded in the AFC device's uh, build. It may be uh, remotely configured, um, but it has to be done securely. And then um, the spec defines certain TLS ciphers that have to be used, um, which ensure that there's strong encryption and integrity protection for the payloads that are sent over that transport. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to come on to the, um, the, the kind of structure of the, uh, the, the messages, the JSON payloads themselves. So there's really just a request and a response, kind of go through those um, one by one. Um, the first one is the slide shows an overview of the of the request. So we have this thing called an available spectrum inquiry request object because we didn't go for brevity. So um, just kind of going through the fields that are shown on the left is a little bit of a, an eye chart, but um, I'll just try to describe it at a high level. So there's a request ID which is just matched between the request and response. It's kind of a somewhat arbitrary value. 
there's a device descriptor which is basically so uh, how this protocol is um, is defined is that what might be called the registration parameters are embedded within every request so it gives some kind of flexibility to the design of the AFC system of how it um, registers internally devices and maintains all the logging and so on that's required by the regulations so in, in it but it, in every request that is present so there's the serial number of the device there's a certific uh, certification ID um, and there's a rule set um, ID which obviously in this case corresponds to the um, FCC part 15 um, rule set um, certification ID is uh, contains the NRA and uh, the identifier like an FCC ID um, the next object is the location object, which we'll come on to a bit more in the detail in the next slide. So that's basically where the AP or the fixed client is um, describing its current geolocation and the uncertainty associated with that. The next two objects called inquired frequency range and inquired channels basically specify the uh, frequency range or channel and or channels on which the uh, AP is requesting power limits, is requesting availability. So there is a, there's two different structures. One of them is based on the, uh, the Wi-Fi, the 802.11 channels. So it's basically a list of what we call operating classes, which with risk of slight um, uh, oversimplification, you can think of as channel bandwidths and also channel numbers. So there's a, li a list of those, basically those channels and channel bandwidths. And it, the AP wants to know the powers available for each of those channels. And or it can request, you know, uh, I want to know the uh, the frequency, if you like, PSD mask from uh, frequency one to frequency two and define those in terms of ranges. So both of those are possible. The uh, AP can request um, just one, just the other or, or both. And there's some slightly different use cases for why, why one may be beneficial over the other. But the um, the protection for the incumbents is, uh, is identical, it's, it's equivalent for those two different methods. There's also a field called min desired power, which is um, an optional field. It's just a, basically if the AP is not interested in any powers below a certain value because it wouldn't want to use them anyway, then it can specify that and that can save the uh, AFC systems and computation. Um, and then there's vendor extensions, which uh, you know can be used optionally uh, depending on, on needs. Um, next slide then, we'll go into a little bit more detail on some of these. Okay, so this is kind of diving into the um, the, geo the the location object within the request. So I showed sort of zoomed in on that location object on the left. There's um, three different kind of geometric alternatives to describe the uh, the horizontal geolocation and the un and the uncertainty. So that um, can be defined in terms of a an ellipse, a linear polygon, or a radial polygon. So I'll show the example here for the for the ellipse where we have a um, in, I mean, in the uh, canonical case, it's probably basically a, a circle, you know, perhaps a, a GPS um, measurement, which ends up with a, a lat long value and then uh, um, some uncertainty radius of the circle that surrounds that, uh, that, that nominal location. So that's described as this ellipse as the major axis, minor um, axis, um, basically the uncertainty radius. And then there's an orientation of that um, ellipse. If it's not a circle, then, then it becomes relevant. Um, so that's the um, describing the uh, you know the, the the location uncertainty and that uncertainty of course has to meet the um, the 95th percentile um, confidence as defined in the rules um, and that's so that's the horizontal domain and then there's also an elevation um, at the bottom left you can see there so that can be defined as a vertical geolocation either as an AGL or AMSL elevation and there's also in that object um, a similar uncertainty value. Um, for the vertical part that also needs to meet the 95th percentile confidence. And then finally, there's a flag called indoor deployment where um, an AP can indicate if it knows it's indoors, outdoors, or unknown. And, you know, depending on the, the, the rules and so on, um, the AF system, system may be able to use that information. Um, so, for example, if an AP is also LPI certified, that might be a basis for it indicating it's, it's indoors. Next slide. Okay, so now this moves on to what the response object looks like. So the AFC system, you know, receives that request with all the registration parameters, the location, the channels or frequencies that it wants the um, the, the the power limits calculated for. 
the uh, AFC system then runs all those calculations, figures out the response, and then includes them in the in the payload of this available spectrum inquiry response object, which is uh, shown here on the left. So again, this has the rule set um, ID, um, which corresponds to the request. Um, sorry, the, the request ID. It's also got um, a rule set ID, which corresponds to the, the rule set that was used to generate these uh, the, these channels. There could have been more than one in the request, but for now we'll keep it simple, assume there was just, just one and that is chosen in the response. And then there are these two main objects that contain the uh, information of interest, really, the uh, available frequency info and the available channel um, info. Um, and those correspond to the, the list of frequencies or list of channels that um, the AP asked for in the, in the request. So if it asked for a kind of frequency, what we call a frequency-based response, then it will have an available frequency info object, which is shown at the um, the, the top uh, right. So that's got a, a field called um, frequency range, um, which you know, specifies the, the the range that the uh, that the second field max PSD corresponds to. And so basically, that is an array of numbers which. Uh, um, are PSD limits, so EARP per, per, per one megahertz um, within the frequency range of, the, of those bins. So that effectively defines a, um, a transmit mask that the APs allow, you know, can use without um, causing interfer uh, interference above the limits to, um, to, to incumbents. And then somewhat similarly, um, this available channel info object so within that object, we've got a um, operating class and we call channel CFI. So that those basically define the list of channels and bandwidths which the final object there, the max EARP array, corresponds to. So you end up in there with a, a list of EIRPs, um, and each of those corresponds to, um, to 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 the channel and bandwidth which was uh, which was asked for asked for in the request. Then finally, there's a an object called um, response, so that contains a response code. Hopefully, that's going to be success. But if something goes wrong, if there's invalid parameters in the request, or um, or you know the AP is outside the uh, right geographical area, and so on, then the spec defines a bunch of response uh, of error codes, um, which indicate the, uh, the the cause of the of the error. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, this next slide just discusses a little bit about what the AP will actually do with the uh, um, with, with the response information that it gets. So uh, some of the details of this will be discussed more in, in the context of the, uh, the the test vectors and, and and that kind of thing. But just just to give it a little overview. So at a high level, that the standard power access point or a fixed client, depending on the case, um, is going to select. You know, a channel and power that it's that it's going to use for its transmissions, and that algorithm that selects the channel and the power limits must act in a manner that's compliant with the contents of the of the response that it got from the AFC system. So the, basically, that means that um, if it's a channel-based response, um, remember that list of channels and EIRPs, then on whichever channel it's actually using, it has to be in that list, and the EIRP that it uses will not exceed the specified EIRP. For that corresponding channel and, and bandwidth, um, or for the frequency-based response, where we have that kind of mask of um, PSD values, the transmit uh, spectrum, including the adjacent channels. So it's, I guess a little note here that for the channel-based response, the uh, AFC system um, includes adjacent channel um, in its calculation. For the transmit spectrum, uh, sort of mask, the uh, the AP has to fit um, its uh, in-channel and adjacent channel within that complete. Um, within that complete mask and so its transmissions must not exceed that mask that's specified on on any frequency a couple of notes so if a channel or frequency is missing from a response so if the uh, if the AP asked for a um, for, for a power for a specific channel but there's nothing present in the response for that channel that's an indication that there's no grant is provided for that channel or frequency so it's um, no it Basically, it can't use it unless it has another mode. Um, the second part is that um, you know we think of a, an AP or fixed client as a standard power device. That device might also be certified to operate under other modes like LPI and so on. So there may be cases where, despite it making an AFC query, it might end up using power limits that are in compliance with 
some other modes of operation rather than necessarily using the, uh, the AFC limits. Um, a third node is that, at least for the um, 802.11, so Wi-Fi based APs, um, the response that it gets back um, effectively corresponds to the um, to the access points limits, but the corresponding client power limits, which are generally 60 Bs below, those um, then get advertised to the um, to, to the stations, to the client devices that connect. And in Wi-Fi world, we call that a, a TPE um, element, transmit power envelope element, which uh, tells the stations the uh, the power limits that they can use when transmitting to that AP. Yeah, and uh, I think some of the details of this one we'll come back to later in the in the presentation today. Uh, next slide. Okay, and I think this is the last one. So this is just a little discussion about proxies. So I've mostly talked about um, standalone or implied um, the, the the scenario for the standalone APs, but the um, Protocol does support um, request and response message structure where there could be multiple requests and responses um, within a single message. So, and that's redesigned for a proxy that's handling requests on behalf of multiple non standalone APs. So, it could be a WLAN controller, something like that, something in the cloud, maybe even, um, which has a bunch of these non standalone APs completely under its control. And it's um, they will maybe in different locations, and so it's sending a kind of batch of requests to the AFC system, um, and it can do that kind of efficiently in in one message. So in in this scenario, the AFC system will process those requests as a batch, and it will provide a response, individual responses for for, for each request. Each request is going to co correspond to a different AFC device. So if you've got you know ten different, of course it, it may not request. Um, all at the same time for every AP under its control, but basically every um, every request which is in that message will have its own device descriptor, its own NRA and serial number and geolocation uh, and so on. So that um, picture in the middle just kind of shows the uh, the high level um, structure that we have for a request where there's an, uh, uh, the, the message contains a, um, a an array of those request objects. And then from a security perspective, so we talked before about um, you know the TLS establishment and so on. So that in in this case, that um, those endpoints are going to be the AFC system and the uh, and the proxy. So the proxy will validate the server certificate and, and so on. And interfaces that you know probably exist between the proxy and the non-standalone APs are not defined in this protocol. They're assumed to be secure. So from the sort of regulatory context, the AFC device entity will consist of the proxy plus the non-standalone APs that are under its control. And I think that is um, it. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, we've received a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, um, are the rule sets customizable by any AFC operator, or are they only the vendor extensions, or are only the vendor extensions dynamic and customizable? Well, that's a good question. So the the, um, the, the vendor extensions are fully customizable; they're just left as um, uh, as arbitrary objects. The rule set IDs currently, we in the current published version of the specification, we only define um, the enumeration if you like for um, FCC part 15. We're actually having some discussions right now on what is the most efficient way to expand that list to other regulators in the, in the future. So I, I don't have a definitive answer on that right now but we are, we, we are thinking that through actually of how we want to how we would um, sort of expand the specification for uh, for, for, for other regulators um, rule sets in the future. Okay. Uh, next question, what kind of latency can we expect between a request and response between the AFC device and AFC uh, system? Mm. That's very much going to depend on the AFC system implementation, so it's very hard to give, a, to, to give an answer. I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we, we don't specify kind of hard timeout values and that kind of thing in the, um, in, in the specification. Um, it is certainly the case that you know, if an AFC system needs to make these calculations from fresh, it's a relatively computationally expensive uh, thing to do. So one might anticipate that um, getting a response can take, you know, several seconds. 
I, I don't think it's going to be huge much longer than that but uh, you know it's not necessarily instantaneous that said you know AFC system implementations may be doing all kinds of clever things to optimize that partial pre-calculations caching of previous results all, all, all that kind of thing notwithstanding that they need to update their own databases you know as they update the ULS and that kind of thing um, on a fairly frequent basis so that there's got, I think that there'll be a, it's a very hard question to, to, to answer because it depends on, on many different variables but between something which is quasi instantaneous and something which takes uh, several seconds I, I think in practice is the, the most likely uh, latency okay Thanks, Thomas. Um, I think we're uh, we've reached the end of the time for this. So um, I've had some other questions come in. So I'll hold those till the end, okay. and uh, we'll we'll put them forward there. So our next speaker is Tevik Yusik from Qualcomm, and Tevik is going to go through the AFC Systems Compliance Test Plan. Hey, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Tevik Yusik uh, with Qualcomm. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Lee, for the introduction. Yeah, um, when I was reviewing this slide, uh, something came to my mind, which is there are two test plans developed by Wi-Fi Alliance. One of them is what we call DUT test plan. Another one is SUT test plan. DUT test plan is uh, for testing access points. Uh, standard power access points and the focus of uh, today's discussion is SUT test plan which is in this context SUT is the system under test that is the AFC system um, this test plan uh, describes the test methodology and procedures to test uh, an AFC system uh, the, the test plan defines multiple tests and for each test we have you know the purpose of the test you know why we are running this test and you know what steps to follow uh, to do this test and what are the expected results um, on the on the right side the figure shows uh, the, the test harness uh, configuration this will be discussed uh, in detail uh, in, in, in uh, upcoming presentations um, just want to note uh, there are you know five main categories of tests uh, in the SUT test plan. Uh, the first one is uh, successful registration and spectrum availability. As the name implies, basically we send an inquiry to an AFC system and we want to make sure that you know, we get a successful response. Then in the case of unsuccessful registration and spectrum uh, availability, that's the second category, um, we want to make sure that when certain components are missing, for example, you know, if the location object is missing or if you have uh, invalid data in certain fields, AFC system does not return uh, channel availability. So that's for unsuccessful registration and spectrum availability. In terms of protection of incumbents, we have three sets of um, uh, test categories. These are uh, fixed service protection, international border protection and special incumbent protection. As the name implies, uh, fixed service protection, uh, we want to make sure uh, you know, fixed services are protected, uh, point to point microwave links, and I believe there are around 100 test, um, uh, test vectors for, uh, for that case. And international border uh, protection is, uh, we want to make sure uh, links on the Canadian side of the border, similarly in Mexico, are protected by the AFC system. And basically it sends requests uh, from locations uh, close to border. Especially in, uh, incumbent protection is protection of radio astronomy. And um, in the next slide, I have an example test case. You know, this is uh, directly copied from the uh, SUT test plan for, for you to understand, uh, you know, how these tests are run. Um, with that said, um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is an example uh, a test uh, in, the, in the SUT test plan. Um, this uh, test uh, plan is, you know, IB, uh, sorry, uh, um, SIP, Special uh, Incumbent Protection, and this, this test is uh, testing uh, whether the radio astronomy sites are protected uh, correctly. Um, 
there are a bunch of uh, test vectors uh, to achieve this and they uh, test uh, different radio astronomy sites and different uh, RLAN parameters. You know, if you change the height, if you're close to them, if you're far away from them, you know, how does the protection is uh, impacted? Um, uh, Stuart is going to cover uh, the details of those. But in here, um, uh, basically, you know, you have the steps, uh, you know, you, you, you set the initial uh, pretest state uh, with the connection to AFC. Uh, system uh, test harness and test database and in the second step here you know it's um, it's saying you know the test harness sends one or more available uh, spectrum inquiry requests to the AFC system and it includes these uh, frequency ranges and then it also uh, makes sure that devices located within the specified distance uh, from radio astronomy or uh, radio observatory so you might be wondering okay how are we going to do this the answer is um, you know, in, in Wi-Fi Alliance test vectors, um, you know, you just read the uh, specific test vector, all the parameters are already there. So that test vectors already covered this, uh, you know, for this step uh, from, from a testing perspective, the, the goal is basically you just read that um, uh, row in the spreadsheet and send that as an inquiry. And we will talk about, you know, how to automate uh, that behavior. Then uh, the uh, number, Step three and step four here are the um, uh, results. You know, what do you expect? First of all, um, you know, you should get a, a success code, right? It shouldn't fail. Um, that's one. And then you mark, you know, did you get the expected results or unexpected result? And in step four, uh, we need to make sure that um, because these specific test vectors are designed uh, such that, uh, you know, they are in the exclusion zone of the radio astronomy side, AFC system uh, shall not include channels or frequencies that overlap with this frequency range, 6650 and 6675 megahertz range. Um, and then, you know, you just verify that uh, the, the responses does not have this frequency range. And again, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance uh, test vector results will have uh, um, expected results. So you just compare against uh, the, the response that you received versus the, you know, the golden response from Wi-Fi Alliance. So, you know, you could do this manually. You could just go and look at the frequency ranges, but it will be really, really time consuming. So this whole process is automated. Um, and this is, again, just an example, you know, uh, how do you run the test and what are the expected results? And we have these four uh, different categories of incumbents and uh, also unsuccessful registration um, where certain components are missing. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to um, these uh, procedures, you know, how you how you run the test and you know, what are the steps and then what are the expected results, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance SUT specification defines the data sources and parameters. So what does this mean? So let's say you have two AFC systems and FCC requirement is, you know, you need to have a certain resolution for your uh, elevation uh, database. But one of the AFC systems might want to use um, um, a, a data set different than others and that might have better resolution, for example. In that case, they will return slightly different results. Uh, one of them is going beyond, you know, what FCC is asking and they, they, you know, they might be more accurate or less accurate, but they are certainly using um, a data set which is, which is, um, you know, beyond what is required. So in order, to, then, you know, it would be very difficult to compare these um, responses from these AFC systems. And what we do is in the SUT test plan, we list all the parameters as well as all the data sets. So. Uh, Wi-Fi Alliance has a GitHub server where you can download the digital elevation masks, uh, the land category data, and finally, um, the, the, the snapshot of ULS at a known date. As you know, the incumbent data is changing from day to day. Every day we are required to read that data, update our AFC system. Then, uh, you know, if you run this test today versus tomorrow, the expected results would be different because there might be uh, a new incumbent uh, that is built in the same location. So in order to prevent, prevent uh, this, this uncertainty, because we will be providing the test vector results, we have a snapshot of uh, the ULS database 
as well as all the uh, supporting uh, documents. So we know exactly what date we are running this test and an HC system will have to be configured um, specifically for this purpose. And when it is running in real time, <coughs> serving clients, it will be using the actual ULS data. And finally, uh, the, the confidence levels and propagation parameters, you know, what type of antenna modeling you use, because if you look at um, TS1014, um, you might have different options to do antenna modeling. You might use the RPEs or you might use a model, etc. So in, in SUT test plan, we fix all these things so that we get the same results from all of the AFC systems. Um, again, the goal is basically to specify these parameters so that all the AFC systems return uh, same or very similar results, and then we can verify them against uh, previously generated golden uh, golden results. Thank you. I think that was my last slide. Are there any questions for Tefik before we move on to the next speaker? I don't see any that have come in. Okay, so thank you very much, Tevik. And next we'll move on to an overview of the AFC system test vectors. Uh, and that's gonna be given by Stuart Strickland. So Stuart, over to you. Thanks very much, Lee. And I see that the camera has uh, failed on me, but it will come up in just a second. Um, I'm Stuart Strickland from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, gonna to talk to you about the uh, the test vectors, which are the uh, detailed instantiation of the AFC test plan. We can move on to the next slide. The, the detailed instantiation of the AFC, there I am, um, test plan um, that will be um, executed by the test harness when it is in communication with the AFC system under test. I'm going to talk about four aspects of these test vectors. Um, first of all, their, their, their structure and coverage, um, how we guarantee um, that there is full coverage of the requirements specified in the TS-1014. Um, we'll go through um, uh, the, the, the um, list of those test factors and what they include. There are about 116. We won't talk about each of them in detail, but you'll get a sense of how they're organized. Um, as Tefik mentioned, we have to be very clear about certain assumptions um, and data sources that are being used by the test harness to evaluate the behavior of the AFC uh, system. And we have to make sure that, to be fair, any AFC system that comes in to be tested understands um, what assumptions and data sources the, um, the evaluation criteria used in creating what, uh, what Tefik uh, referred to as, uh, as, as the gold uh, standard of, of responses. Um, that, that the process of determining what was golden um, was not a completely straightforward one. Um, and so I'll give you some insight into the methodology that we used in determining um, what, um, what behavior an AFC system should exhibit in order to demonstrate that it is compliant with the, um, the TS 1014 requirements. So let's, let's move on to the next slide. So talk first about what, what the um, test vectors are. So they're essentially a pair. Each test vector is a pair of uh, a spectrum availability inquiry request and a corresponding response. The request will be sent by the uh, test um, harness to the AFC system under test and the response is what comes back and will be evaluated by the test harness. Um, these are based on the structures that Thomas defined and shared with you earlier um, in the EFC interface, and the, um, the content of them has been largely dictated by the uh, tests that were outlined in the specification in the, in the, in the test plan. And the responses um, are aligned, and we've gone through a process of alignment with the requirements of the uh, of the TS 1014 requirements. Um, so in each case, um, these the the parameters that are in the uh, request, specifically the um, uh, location um, at which we place the um, hypothetical uh, access point that's seeking spectrum availability, those are defined to exercise a number of different permutations of the um, 
uh, of the test. And let's go into the next slide, and I think this will become a little bit more clear what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Yeah, so so there there are about a hundred and some odd, maybe <clears throat> maybe actually 120 or something um, test vectors, um, and they are categorized uh, to correspond with the sections of the test plan. Um, there are some that are quite straightforward. Uh, requests come into the AFC system that are missing certain information or that um, uh, fail to um, <clears throat> conform to FCC requirements as, as, as um, documented in the 1014, um, and those are to be um, either accepted or, or, or rejected. Um, <clears throat> the, the most interesting and the bulk of the tests are tests designed to uh, protect uh, the incumbent fixed services. And we wanted to make sure that we had complete coverage, that we covered um, uh, all the different terrain morphologies, that we covered cases where the access points were indoors and where they were outdoors, where they were at low elevations, where they were at high elevations, where they were near um, an incumbent and where they were at further distances so that we could uh, exercise and, and, and test the exercise of different propagation models um, in different land coverage types um, and in, in, in the presence of incumbents that had different types of antennas. Um, we also test individual requests uh, from one access point as well as aggregated requests from, um, from a proxy. Um, it was initially straightforward to identify the logical permutations, but we also had multiple exchanges between the Wi-Fi Alliance and the Wind Forum um, to collect additional cases that particularly incumbents thought would be uh, important and deserved um, uh, explicit, explicit testing. And as we were developing this, we, we, we had a pretty open policy towards adding test vectors to this list um, if, if uh, any party who came to us um, either through liaison or as a member of the WFA um, had a test vector that they wanted to include, it was included. Um, we, in addition to those, um, we have a special set of test vectors um, to test uh, along international borders. Um, there are rules um, set up in the communications we have from the FCC and those are documented in the TS-1014 about how to handle uh, incumbents that um, may lie close to the border of the United States um, and potentially could experience interference from, uh, from access points operating this band within the United States. Um, we have uh, four test cases um, that exercise this for Canada. We don't yet have any for Mexico. There's still some open issues that we haven't yet uh, resolved about um, uh, testing those, but I expect those will be straight, straight forward and there are only four additional tests. Um, there's one more test that is specific to Canada um, that we'll come to in a moment that exercises some different algorithms, and that's to do with this category of special incumbents. So um, there are a number of special incumbents, um, typically radio astronomy observatories that have been identified by the FCC, um, which require a kind of, ex they, they basically describe a kind of exclusion zone, and we want to make sure that um, spectrum isn't allocated to, uh, to access points within those exclusion zones that would interfere with uh, those observatories. Um, the same rules are applied to um, one radio astronomy observatory that we've been made aware of uh, near the border in Canada, um, and so a special test case is also defined for that. Let, let's go on to the next uh, page. So it was reasonably straightforward, let's move on, um, reasonably straightforward um, to define the, uh, the questions that were going to be asked of the SUT. It's a little bit more complicated to define what the appropriate responses are. And we wanted to make sure that in every case, the responses that we um, that we came that we, that we specified were sufficient to protect um, incumbents, but we didn't also want to disadvantage uh, access uh, AFC systems that might have simplified algorithms that were um, more conservative um, and um, and returned results that were even more protective. And we also didn't want to inhibit innovation. Um, and so um, we 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 went through a process that I'll describe in a moment. Um, as as Tefik mentioned it's extremely important that um, that the uh, systems that come in under test use the same assumptions that the 
um, that, that we used in creating the expected test vector responses. And we, we, in, in doing this, we made sure that all of the data that an AFC system would be expected to use would be publicly available. And in cases where some of that data might change over time, that we created a snapshot for use during the, this, uh, the, this exercise. Those snapshots will be available both to the systems under test, and they are the ones documented and were used by um, in creating the, the test vectors. Um, in addition, there were a number of assumptions that um, are not required or specified clearly in the regulations, um, but that we discovered make a difference um, as we calculate the, um, the expected responses. Those are all documented in the um, system test plan in an appendix, and they've been communicated back and forth with the, um, between the Wi-Fi lines and the wind form to make sure that all of our assumptions are aligned. Um, and uh, so, so that you know, any, anyone coming to take these tests know, knows the basis on which the uh, um, expectation criteria were established. Now let's go to the last slide, and I'll talk about what was really the interesting process for us of figuring out what, what are the right answers, what are the expected answers. So um, we, we didn't believe that it was possible to create a a, a perfect set of answers that represented the, um, the, the absolute most efficient way of determining um, spectrum availability that would be um, perfectly protective, but also perfectly efficient. Um, what we had to rely upon were the algorithms that members who participated in this process had developed and were developing based on all these assumptions and based on all these requirements um, and um, uh, asking the, the, those members um, who we're in a position to generate responses, um, and these are prospective AFC system operators, um, to run the requests that we had defined um, and to come back to us um, to deliberate over candidate responses. And um, when we first did this, um, there was a great deal of difference in the responses. Um, we discovered that there were tacit assumptions we hadn't previously articulated, um, that sometimes AFC systems were using different sources of data, um, that they'd interpreted the 1014 requirements uh, slightly differently. Um, we went through a, a long process of reconciling all of that, um, and we knew that it was never going to be absolutely perfect, so we set ourselves a criteria. We, we decided that um, when we got to the point that all of the responses, each individual response, that is each power level for each frequency bin or for each um, channel um, was within 2 dB of the others of the population, that we would call that close enough, um, and that we would then uh, create a set of responses that would constitute um, a mask. And as long as the responses that come back from the SUT are no more than 2 dB greater, that is that they're allowing power no more than 2 dB above what we had defined as the expected response, which was an average of a 2 dB spread, um, that that would be considered an expected response. Um, but if there were to be a more efficient um, implementation and that more efficient implementation were in a position to justify itself um, and uh, might receive a unexpected result, I mean, it might provide an unexpected result that was more generous or a higher power level, um, that those, those systems would be given an opportunity to, um, to justify that response and to show what, what better data they used or what more efficient algorithms they used and how that was um, sufficiently protective. Um, so the, the, the crux of that is not that we're not the arbiter of that. Obviously, the regulatory authorities are the ar arbiter of that ultimately. Um, but we did want to allow for that. And that is also why these responses are called expected responses and not pass-fail criteria. So we're, we're not saying that a device that comes in with a, a result that's slightly higher is has failed. We are saying that it has generated a response that is deviant from the expectation that was established based on all of the assumptions that went into building the, the test vectors. Um, these test vectors are defined, as, a, as I said, as a pair of requests and responses, and they, are, uh, they, they serve as the, um, the, the, the source of um, the work that the, uh, that the test harness um, that Austin and Andy are going to talk about next um, will execute in uh, testing the, the systems under test. So I'll, I'll, I'll 
stop there and take questions if there are any. Uh, any questions for Stuart? Uh, I'm not seeing any at this time. Um, so I guess, thank you, Stuart. Uh, give it one more second for questions to come in. Oh, here's a question. Hold on, hold on. it's really long. Um, okay, so the, the, there's actually a couple of questions that have come in, Stuart. So the first one is how many different contributors have the expected responses been based on? Um, and are there any specific test vectors that cause the biggest initial divergence? Right. Um, so there were there were four main participants in the WFA work, but we were in in, in contact with non WFA members who also ran some of these algorithms. We didn't participate in quite the same way because they weren't members and they weren't part of the discussion. Um, and we liaised test vectors to the wind forum who uh, also I understand has members who were able to analyze and, and, and participate in this process indirectly. Um, one of those four contributors um, was from the, um, the so-called open AFC group. And so they, they actually represented uh, a, num a number of others. And the way that the open AFC works is that each one can be configured with parameters that are slightly different. So you could you know, have a basic core, but divergence. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're confident that we, 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 we got all the input that was reasonable for us to get given, given time constraints and given participation, um, and that that was expert um, input and it was independent of each other and converged reasonably well. Um, the, the, the ones that gave us the most, so one of the things you can imagine is that although we created these permutations in order to exercise particular characteristics like a separation of more than a kilometer from an FS, um, in many cases there are large numbers of incumbents who were present in the vicinity of an RLAN um, that exercise other um, um, permutations incidentally, not the main one that we wanted to test. Um, and so there were some cases where, um, because there were a lot of incumbents and because people might have selected um, different ones, that it became kind of difficult to tease apart exactly what the cause was of a divergence. And so it was mostly in those um, fixed service protection ones where there were typically a large number of incumbents and it became complicated to tease out exactly what the sources of differences were where we had the the most initial divergence um but uh, that was relatively straightforward to solve once we started digging into who used what incumbents to reach their results um i wouldn't say that there were any that were uh hard to resolve because the algorithms were difficult or because um there was a disagreement over what should be done I will say the most straightforward ones were the um, the special incumbents because the, the the description of how to protect is is the most straightforward in that case. Yeah, and um, I'll just comment as well. Um, you know, and it's sort of shown by the dashed line on the screen is that there has been a lot of conversation back and forth between the the Wireless Innovation Forum and the Wi-Fi Alliance related to the test vectors. Uh, Stuart mentioned this earlier, whenever we identified that perhaps there should be a new test vector added or, or a few new test vectors added, uh, we would pass those over to the Wi-Fi Alliance via liaison. And the Wi-Fi Alliance has been very accommodating of in uh, adding those in uh, as they come in. Uh, we're currently going through a, a review of the test vector response in the, in the Wireless Innovation Forum as well. Those have all been passed uh, to us or or a subset of those have been passed to us and the rest are expected to come in the next week or so. Um, we're going through the evaluation of those test vector responses now. And then, you know, if we find anything that I we identify as a gap or an issue, uh, we can again pass that back to the Wi-Fi Alliance um, for adjustment. So I, I think the communications between the two organizations allowing the members of the WIND Forum uh, who may not necessarily be members of the Wi-Fi Alliance and, and vice versa. Uh, I think that communication has been really good, allowing uh, both organizations to kind of move this forward. Um, we have time for one more question. 
Uh, and let me see if I can find one that's short. Uh, so here's one, Y2DB. <laughs> Sorry, um, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> Sure. So you guys did expected values plus two dB. Why'd you pick oh, two? Oh, yeah. So there was some precedent for that. I think in the uh, in work that had been done previously with um, uh, uh, the SAS systems in, in in CBRS, so we took some lessons from that. Um, also, um, when when we when when we resolved that we were going to uh, consider our work done when we converged within 2dB of each other, um, we knew there was going to be a spread of, you know, at most 2dB from um, from the contributors uh, that were, uh, you know, from high and, and low. And we didn't want to come up with a um, response that would um, that would result in a failure of one of the responses that we thought was completely fine um, in terms of protection, um, but slightly different from the others. So um, it, the 2dB that we set as a kind of grace or margin um, is related to the 2dB target that we had for um, for convergence and based on a precedent that we saw in, in, in previous work in this sort of technology. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, next, we're going to move on to a discussion on the traceability matrix, tracing the requirements uh, to the test vectors. Um, and that discussion is going to be led by Masood Alfat from Federated Wireless. So welcome, Masood. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, can I be heard, yeah. Lee? Yeah, your audio is fine. Thanks. Good. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Masood Olfat. I'm the Vice President of Technology from Federated Wireless. And uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm going to talk about overall the, the role of the Wien Forum in the, the test and certification process and the, and the traceability matrix. Uh, next page, please. So uh, as mentioned by Stuart and Lee, uh, there has been a very good communication between FC, uh, between Win Forum and between uh, uh, Win Forum and Wi-Fi Alliance uh, for the development of the uh, test vectors as well as the the review and uh, the concerns. Um, so and we have uh, had uh, lots of communication through liaison. Uh, mainly the objective that we do in the Win Forum group is to first of all uh, work with Wi-Fi Alliance to develop the test program. Uh, we developed the test software, test harness, which is going to be presented by uh, Austin and Andy after me, and also work on the uh, lab process. Uh, but when it comes to the test development, test vector development, uh, what we do in Win Forum is mainly we are uh, involved in three areas. One of them is that to make sure that some of the AFC applicants who are not member of Wi-Fi Alliance have the opportunity to be part of the process for test vector development. Uh, secondly, uh, we because there are some members of incumbent community are more involved in the wind form process, we make sure that we do a very uh, delicate evaluation of the test vectors. And as a result of that, there has been lots of the back and forth between us and Wi-Fi Alliance. And also the third area that we want to make sure that we address is that uh, uh, 6 gigahertz is not Wi-Fi. 6 gigahertz is... Uh, uh, basically allowed to be used by any uh, unlicensed technology that use LBT. So as a result of that, we have to make sure that some of the non-Wi-Fi technologies that are expected to use 6 gigahertz band are also taken into account. And uh, one, one major example is 5G and RU. So uh, that's the area that we've been working. So the, the tool that we have used to, um, to do this is uh, something called traceability matrix. If you go to the next page, please. Uh, the traceability matrix that we have used is uh, based upon uh, requirements. So what we have done, <coughs> we have taken every requirement <coughs> and for, for every single requirement, we have def defined a row uh, in, a, in a spreadsheet. And the requirements that I'm talking about are basically uh, uh, the three parts. Uh, we, we are calling them R0, R1, and R2 requirements. Uh, there are some part 15 requirements which are not captured in document TS-11014, which is the main body of the uh, requirements developed by WinForum. Uh, so I call them a fourth category. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> R zero requirements are the ones that are uh, verbatim the uh, copy paste of part 15, and they're captured in document TS 1014. Uh, R1 requirements are the ones that are derived from the FCC rule. And finally, R2 requirements are the one that uh, are imposed by WinForum to make sure that uh, those other rules are met. So those are basically industry development of the requirement. They are not necessarily FCC. So uh, there are some R3 requirements, but uh, we are not capturing them in, um, uh, in uh, traceability matrix. So... Uh, for each row, uh, whether it is R0, R1, or R2, or part 15, what we do, we identify the requirement itself, the requirement ID, and the relevant part 15 rule. As I said, R2 requirements are developed to, to meet the FCC rules. Um, examples are, for example, the, the parameters for propagation model, or how we an address the antenna characteristic. So uh, we identify the, the relevant part 15 rule. Uh, we identify the tested entity, which entity should be tested, the methodology for test, uh, which test specification we are using, and actually the required test vectors, which means that uh, for each requirement, we look at the list of test vectors and make, we, we wanna make sure that all of the requirements that are captured in the traceability matrix, which are composed of those uh, four categories that I mentioned, for each one, we have uh, <coughs> one or a set of test vectors. <coughs> so at the end of the day, uh, the, the lab that performs those test uh, plans, they have a tool, which is this traceability matrix, to map the test vectors to the requirements. And based on that, they can uh, put the report to FCC that which requirements are, are met and which requires are not met by the, uh, by the AFC applicant. Next page, please. So example of, uh, we can go to next page, good. So example, I put some example of the, uh, of the traceability matrix. Uh, as you see in the uh, first three, four columns, we have identified the requirement, the relevant part 15 rule. And then uh, especially the green uh, uh, column is the most important one. That's the area that we identify the test vectors. So uh, the, the way that we deal with, the, uh, with the, each requirement is that we have three, three possibilities. If you go to next page, please, uh, Lee. Uh, there are three possibilities for each row. Uh, one possibility is that we call the requirement, uh, yeah, Lee, if you can go to the next page, please. Thank you. So uh, uh, the, um, we call them, uh, there are some tests that, uh, some requirements that test is not applicable. For example, there, <coughs> there are definitions or there are some device requirement. And uh, because this is focused on the AFC testing, uh, we don't define the, uh, the testing for tests for device uh, requirements. Um, that's one uh, group of, um, of requirements. There is another group of requirements that we call them attestation. Um, and uh, those are the ones that uh, basically testing them in a, in a lab environment might not be feasible or might be very complex uh, and or potentially uh, basically, again, the, the, the feasibility of testing them in the lab is, is problematic. For example, proving that AFC performs data retainment. So uh, uh, in order to do them in the lab, perhaps a long time has to be taken and there's a complex process. So we put that in as attestation. This is, a, we have done exactly the same thing in the case of CBRS. And of course we have communicated that with FCC and uh, incumbents and that was acceptable with, to them. So a group of test cases uh, or requirements are being addressed as attestation and there is no test for them. Uh, there are some tests, uh, some requirements that again, might not be feasible to do in the uh, uh, in the lab, but uh, perhaps we expect them to be done in the in the field test. Um, and finally, the the main uh, set of requirements are the ones that we develop the test vectors. So, for example, as you see in this figure, the second the first row is is a requirement that uh, it's about the the storing the registration information. We consider them attestation. Uh, then the second row is about uh, 
uh, the, to uh, deny a spectrum access to a device which is not allowed. For example, FCC ID is not correct. We have test cases for that and test vectors. So we identify the, the relevant test vectors and the last row is also uh, attestation. So these are the four ways that every single requirement have been developed. So in other words, if you look at that green column and the requirements, uh, there, we are kind of creating a map between those test vectors and uh, uh, and the requirements. M next page, please. And as a result of this uh, this uh, activity, we have identified a lot of new test vectors that needs to be added, some of the areas, some requirements that have to be changed, and we have communicated that back to <coughs> to Wi-Fi Alliance. And uh, as Lisa said, there has been a very good uh, communication and work uh, cooperation. Uh, some of the areas, of, uh, things about the security that has been captured in the traceability matrix, just wanted to mention that. Uh, so when we talk about the security, we are talking about two things. Uh, one is uh, the authentication of the standard power devices by the AFC, and that is uh, in the traceability matrix. We are we are considering them testing in, being tested in the lab. Another side is the uh, the authentication of the AFC by the device. So for that, uh, the, the authentication of the AFC by the device has two parts. One is uh, the use of server certificate. The, basically, we are mandating the AFC to use this, some type of server certificate, and that will be tested in the lab. However, uh, what is not tested in the lab is what type of server certificate is used. Uh, we are not going to testing that. We are not going to. We are going to put that as a, a um, attestation. Uh, however, we just want to mention that WinForum, uh, it's, I'm just talking on behalf of WinForum here, uh, WinForum compliance rec has required uh, some type of a trusted certificate authority. Uh, but again, that's a, that's a discussion that basically we leave it between the AFC applicant and the regulatory to decide. But WinForum specification requires uh, a trusted certificate authority. And also another thing that we are not going to test in the lab and test harness is not equipped is the type of cipher suites that uh, is used. Uh, once again, um, in CBRS, we, we tested all of these and because of the sensitivity and the, in, uh, the federal uh, operation. Uh, but here, uh, we, we thought that uh, basically this is done based on attestation. Um, the SPD authentication, we are uh, suggesting three areas. One is no authentication. And for that, we allow the applicants to work with, with the regulatory. But uh, WinForum specification requires um, uh, the, the other two that are used either with, with client certificates as well as the bearer tokens, and both of them are being done in the uh, in the test harness. And I think next page is my last page, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, I think uh, as I said for the for the SPD authentication, uh, whether it is a token bearer or uh, or client certificates, uh, basically we are uh, we are we are going to have a uh, positive and negative test in the uh, traceability matrix. Is, it has been captured that we don't have a specific test vectors for that. Rather, any of the existing test vectors can be used to perform positive tests using valid credentials and negative using invalid credentials. So basically, the, uh, the we can have either predetermined configuration files containing these uh, credentials, or we can have a, a kind of an online uh, operation. So. Um, Oh, I think this is my last page. So uh, I, I just want to give you a high level of uh, the, the test framework and the certification framework in the lab. In the center, we have the AFC SUT. And of course, AFC SUT has to be configured and set up. AFC SUT could communicate with some repositories. We have some snapshots of the NLCD data, the ULS, as well as the WinForum repository, for example, radio uh, radio architectures. That's one side. On the other side, the test harness, basically, which I'm, I'm sure the details is going to be given by um, by Austin and Andy. But basically, the the assumption is that the test harness would provide the request as if it's a it's a device, it's a regular device. The response is, uh, and those uh, requests are from the list of the test vectors that Stuart described. The responses are captured from the AFC SUT, and that's a response module. Uh, they are compared with the mask data, which are the expected responses that Stuart explained. And then based on that, uh, the results are logged, whether it is 
pass or explanation needed. So that's the overall architecture of the test framework in the lab that I'm sure uh, Austin and Andy are gonna go over the detail. I think this was my last page and uh, I'm open for maybe a few questions. Yeah, I think we don't have time for questions at this point, so we'll hold them to the end. Sure. Uh, so at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Austin Egbert from uh, Baylor University and Andy Clegg from Google, and they're going to run through the AFC system test harness. So welcome guys. Yeah, thanks, Lee, and uh, thanks to everyone who's attending today. Uh, we're excited to share with all of you the Test Harness software that we've developed that automates the execution of the tests that we've been uh, discussing today. Uh, next slide. So specifically, the Test Harness automates the process of establishing a connection to the AFC system under test, sending the test inquiries, comparing the received response against the expected response, and then logging which fields in that response provide either expected or unexpected values for each test vector. The code is publicly available on GitHub at the link on the screen here, and we'll show how to download the code later uh, in this webinar in case anyone's not terribly familiar with GitHub. Uh, inside the Harness repository, you'll also find JSON formatted versions of the test vector inquiries, uh, Harness and client authentication files, Python modules for mes message validation and uh, message parsing, and then overall documentation for the test harness as a whole. Uh, once the finalized test vector expected responses are published, this repository will also have JSON formatted versions of those vector response masks. Uh, next slide, please. So the test harness software requires Python and then two third-party Python libraries for execution. Specifically, the harness needs Python 3.10 uh, as it uses features that weren't available in 3.9 and earlier. Uh, versions after 3.10 will probably work. I think 3.11 came out a month or two ago, but we haven't tested it for compatibility, so um, you're welcome to try it, but we don't guarantee that that should work. And then the two libraries that you need are the requests library, which handles the HTTPS communication, and then also the Tomli library, which handles parsing the harnesses configuration files. Uh, once you have Python installed, these libraries can be easily installed using the Python package manager pip. Uh, the slides and demonstrations here in this section assume that Python has been installed to the system path. Uh, and if your Python installation differs slightly, you might need to use a different command format. I have here a few different uh, examples for different ways that Python and PIP might be configured on your machine. So you might just have to experiment and figure out how you have everything installed. Um, next slide, please. So inside the harness directory itself, uh, you'll find a lot of files that you really shouldn't need to be worried about because those are mostly just the actual code that runs the test harness. However, the directories that I've indicated here are gonna be very helpful for configuring and operating the harness. Uh, these folders include the auth folder, which is intended to provide necessary support files for client authentication, like any client certificates that you need or specific bearer token implementations or other authentication modules that an AFC system operator might provide you. Um, there's also the config folder, which is where the configuration files for the harness and AFC connections are stored. And then there are the inquiries and masks folders, which contain those JSON formatted um, versions of the inquiry and expected response mask files for each and every test vector. There's a logs folder, which is where the harness will output um, detailed results for each test that is run. And then the responses folder will actually log the raw JSON responses that it gets back from the AFC system. Uh, all of these folders are mostly just suggested placeholders. The harness is configured to use them at def by default, but you can choose to use other folders at runtime in case that's something that's useful for your testing workflow and separating out results for different AFCs or different trial runs or something like that. Um, if that is useful for you, we'll cover how you can make those adjustments here in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. So next, I wanna talk about the files that define the actual tests that can be run. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's sort of two parts to every test vector. There's the inquiry and the expected response, or which we call the mask file within the test harness. Um, by default, those are located in the inquiries and mask folders we just mentioned. So the um, sort of official WFA 
setup we have converted to JSON and you can find in that, that folder. Um, to match an inquiry with its expected response when executing the test, the harness requires that these test vector files be named with uh, the naming convention you see on the screen where the test vector name that the harness looks for is the full file name without the .json extension. And then the corresponding mask file that goes with that inquiry should be named identically with just an underscore mask appended to the file name before that extension. Um, the included test vector file names map up to the Wi-Fi Alliance test case IDs. Um, so for example, for AFCS FSP6, the file name is afcs.fsp.6.json and then that underscore mask.json respectively. Um, next slide, please. So earlier we had some folks talk about the SDI specification that has the formats for the inquiries and the responses. Um, for the test harness purposes, we've developed a complementary structure for the response mask format. Uh, for the most part, it's very, very similar to the response format itself um, with just a few differences that I outlined here. And so in several cases, we've changed the name of one of the fields um, to reflect that we're dealing with an expected response. So instead of available channel info, we have expected available channel info. Um, the response field that normally has the response code and some possible supplemental information explaining why a response code was generated is replaced instead with just a list of expected response codes. So any response codes that would be acceptable to provide in reply to an inquiry should be included in this list. So for instance, if you wanted to uh, allow an AFC to present the general failure code or some more specific error code for a specific error, um, you would wanna list all of those. Any response codes that are defined in the SDI specification but aren't included in this list will cause an unexpected test result to be generated. Um, and then if an AFC uses any vendor defined error codes that aren't defined in the actual specification, those are just ignored. The test harness does what it can to recognize anything like vendor extensions or vendor defined codes and just say, hey, here's this thing, but it's not a standard thing. I don't know how to do with it. And it calls it out. So if you need to check anything in more detail, you're welcome to do that. Um, the max EIRP and max PSD fields are now objects instead of just single values like they are in the response. And that's just to um, allow for some more complex bounds checking if needed. Um, if anyone's generating additional vectors or something to test things on their own end, this can be kind of useful to sort of bound that. In general, according to the WFA test vectors, only the upper bound would be set to the expected value that they have uh, come to an agreement on. And then finally, uh, there's no availability expire time in the mask like there is in the response. Uh, next slide. So moving on to how to configure the test harness itself. Uh, harness configuration is split amongst a few different files just to kind of keep things modular where you can swap them out as needed. Um, there's one file that handles the AFC system connection settings specifically, and another that configures where the harness should look for its inputs and outputs from. Um, both of these files follow the TOML standard. There's a link to that specification on the screen if you want to refer to it. Um, and the Files that are inside of the uh, harness repository right now are fully documented, um, provide a baseline configuration that you can get started with, and it has commented placeholders for all of the supported options. There's also a Python file that I'll discuss in a bit, which determines which test should actually be executed by the harness in case you want to just run a subset at some point, which I'll discuss uh, in a little bit. Um, starting with the AFC connection configuration, the default file is in that config folder as afc.toml by default. And this file has two required fields that you absolutely have to have for the harness to work. And that's the AFC systems base URL. This follows the syntax from the SDI. So you need the HTTPS prefix. You don't need the slash um, available spectrum inquiry kind of method URL. Um, there's an option in there for changing that if somebody has something non-standard, but by default, it will use the, it appends that for you. And then the other file, uh, other field is the client authentication type. And so uh, like Masood was saying, we support a number of different options. We've tried to keep it very open. So this is useful for everyone, depending on which route they take. 
um, default option is none. So if you're testing an AFC that doesn't require any kind of client authentication, you can leave this to none. Um, if you do need to test client certifi uh, certificates or something like bearer tokens, there's options for certificates and then custom, which we'll discuss uh, on the next slide, actually, if we can go there. So if an AFC is using some type of client authentication, there will be a few more fields that are otherwise optional that you would need to provide. Uh, if you're doing client certificates, set the client, uh, the authorization, authentication type to cert, and then you'll also need to provide the client cert field as a path to the client certificate. If that certificate has been created in a way where the private key isn't embedded in that, then there's also an extra field where you can specify a path to the private key file. Um, and then for the other types of authentication, this should, in theory, cover basically anything somebody might want to come up with separate from client certificates. So bearer tokens fall under sort of this custom um, option. The general idea here is that um, if an AFC is using some type of other authentication, they'll be able to provide a Python class and module that extends the request libraries auth base interface. So there's a few different requirements um, that go into that, but basically this allows it to embed the bearer token that it needs into the message headers when it passes it on to the AFC. Um, if a custom authentication method needs any additional information, like maybe some OAuth2 parameters or additional file paths that it needs to read from, those can be passed in the configuration file um, and those are handed off to the class's initializer. There's a bare bones example of how this sort of custom authentication method can be developed in auth slash custom underscore auth dot pi. Uh, the example there is fairly simple. It will read a bearer token in from a file, embed that in the message and pass it on to the AFC. So for any AFC system operators who are looking to add support to the test harness or any test labs that are needing to uh, extend to support a different AFC, that's sort of a baseline for where you can look for how to support those other authentication methods. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So in some cases, you might want to choose just to run a subset of tests rather than the entire suite of tests. Uh, by default, the harness executes um, the list of test names refer, uh, returned by a function that's in the CFG slash test to run dot pi file. Um, if the first element of the list returned by this function is the string all, then it will the harness will try to run all of the tests, which it by which I mean all of the .json files that are in the inquiries directory. Um, if there's issues or files aren't matching up correctly between that and the mask folder, it'll throw an error, but it's going to try and run everything that it finds there. Um, otherwise, it will only execute the actual test names that are listed in that list that gets returned. Uh, since this is a Python file, you're welcome to modify this to filter names programmatically with regular expressions or some other approach. Uh, the only requirement on this is that a list is returned that has valid test names that can be found in the inquiries folder, or it's a list that starts with the first entry being all. Anything after all gets ignored. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, for configuration stuff, um, there is the, all of the remaining options are found in the config slash harness.toml file. Um, this lets you override most of the other defaults that the harness assumes. So you can have a separate AFC configuration file or connection file, swap that out here. Um, you can change the test to run file with a different one. So you don't have to keep changing the same files. You can have multiple copies and just swap out which one you want to refer to. And then you can also change which directories the harness uses for finding the inquiries uh, mask files and where it logs its results to. Um, next slide. So sort of your last chance, last stop to try and change anything from the defaults is when you actually go to execute the harness. If you just want to use the default configuration in that config slash harness.toml file, uh, you can just execute the test harness with python dot slash test main dot pi. Um, and again, if you need to replace Python with Pi or whatever else you need to for your local installation to work correctly, 
Um, and then if you do want to change and use a different configuration file at runtime, there are two command line options that let you do that. There is dash dash harness underscore config that lets you use a different overall harness configuration file. And then there's also dash dash sut underscore config. And this lets you override the AFC configuration file specified by the harness configuration file. And so that me that's so that let's say you have a harness configuration file you're using for all of your testing and you want to test different AFCs, you can just add this command line option and it will switch to the different AFC files uh, as you execute that. So there's a few examples of how you can sort of combine the different um, command line options if you want to do that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so once the harness is started executing, it'll provide some output in several different ways. First, ongoing status, warnings, unexpected results, and a final test summary will be printed to standard output, which in most cases, unless you're doing something crazy, will be your console window. Um, any responses that come in from the AFC system are logged on a per test basis to the responses folder with the naming convention you see here. Uh, all log messages, including any inquiries that are sent, any responses that are received, and whatever response masks were used in that testing are, are written on a per test basis to the logs folder with that naming convention. And then finally, a full set of all of the log messages generated by all of the tests um, are written to the logs folder as harness underscore main dot log. And so this includes the configuration settings that the harness is using. Um, this is mostly for if you run into an issue, this has everything that might be needed to troubleshoot what's going on with the harness. Um, and for that reason, it gets overridden every time you run the harness. The other files will, because they're tagged with the date time, won't be overridden each time you run the test harness. Uh, next slide, please. So earlier we talked about the possible outcomes from uh, the different test vectors, expected or unexpected. This slide covers what those possible results mean from the harnesses perspective. So if a test receives an expected result, then everything that the AFC system provided in its response was within the expected bounds set by the mask file. Uh, if a test receives an unexpected result, then one or more fields in the JSON response were either missing or differed from the values expected by the mask file. And so if that occurs, the logs will have specific information on what the discrepancy was for each test. And then finally, if a test receives a skipped result, then that means that something went wrong while executing the test in a way where the harness can't say one way or the other whether a result was expected or unexpected. So for instance, if the harness is misconfigured and it can't find the mask file, that would result in a skip test because it wasn't able to, to run the test correctly. Um, and yeah, at the end, the number of tests that get each result are provided at the end of the log files. And then a specific list of which tests obtained what result is in the harness underscore log file for to call out by name, these tests were expected result, these tests were unexpected result. Um, next slide, please. All right, so the complete log messages in the log forms have the format that you kind of see here at the top of the slide has the time, the test name that they were associated with, and then a log level followed by the message that's actually being logged. Um, these log levels have specific meanings in the context of the harness, so I'll go over those real quick. Debug messages provide essentially a detailed walkthrough of the steps taken by the test harness and logs any data that was ingested by the harness, be that that's where the inquiries and masks, all those also get logged for debugging purposes. If there's an issue with the test harness, these messages are essentially to help identify what's going on within the harness and where the problem is happening to help narrow things down for troubleshooting purposes. Uh, info messages document any harness configuration options and any comparisons that give an expected result. So anything that goes according to plan basically shows up with an info message. Um, warning messages can arise if something happens that may or may not require somebody to take a closer look at it. Um, for instance, if an inquiry message differs from the, inspect uh, the expected SDI spec, that will end up triggering a warning. Um, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that the test will fail. If the AFC responds to it in the way that it's supposed to, then the test can still end up with an expected result. So warnings don't necessarily mean something's gone wrong, but if a test ends up getting an unexpected or skipped result, the warnings might be sort of the first flag that gets raised to say something's not going the way that it was supposed to. Um, unlike warnings, errors specifically indicate something's happened in the results that lead to an unexpected test result being assigned for the for the test. And then a critical message is specifically something's gone wrong executing the test. So not something was unexpected, but we've had an error that keeps us from running the test. So in that case, that specific test would get skipped. Um, for these log levels, all of these log levels will be output to the log files. Um, looking at the console output, anything of info and above is logged if it comes from sort of the test main, just to kind of keep things a little bit more condensed. And then anything of warning or higher, or I guess lower on this list also gets logged from uh, to the standard output. So you have an idea as things are executing sort of what's going on. Um, next slide, please. All right, so with all of that out of the way, it's time for the fun part. Um, so Lee, can you pass me control of the screen? Yes, I believe you have it now. All right, just got to figure out which option. I think I want this one. All right, can yep. everybody see my screen OK? Yeah, okay, we're great. seeing your screen. Great, so here is the um, GitHub repository. Um, it's at the link that uh, we have in the slides. And so in here, you can find everything related to the harness. Um, when you go to download this, um, probably um, the simplest way to do it is if you're familiar with uh, Git, you can um, clone it using the normal methods. Uh, if not, and you just want to download a zip file, that option's here under this green code folder. Um, inside the repository, there's a couple different folders to get to the harness code we were talking about. That's inside the source folder and then the harness folder. Um, in this repository, there's a readme file, um, which shows up here if you scroll down. This covers a lot of what uh, we've just been talking about, um, some of it in a little bit more detail, and will also point you to documentation within specific files that you may wanna consult um, for more information as well. Um, this should generally be a good reference for um, anything if you do run into questions or need a reminder of sort of what we've talked about today. Um, moving on to the actual downloaded code. Um, uh, I have up here in Visual Studio Code, you're welcome to use sort of whatever way you want to execute the harness that you want. Um, but I just want to kind of show you uh, examples of some of the things that we've been talking about so you have an idea what to look for when you go to actually run the tests. So inside the CFG folder, we have that harness.toml file I had mentioned. Um, and as promised, everything is pretty thoroughly documented. Um, each option that is available in it has a description of what it does. And so this is where you can swap out which AFC configuration file gets used. Here's where you can say where it needs to find tests to run. And then down here is where you can specify which folders and directories you want it to use when executing everything. Um, moving on to the uh, AFC configuration file, we have much the same thing. Again, documentation for all of the different options. Uh, here's where at base URL, you would want to set up the actual URL for the AFC you're testing. I have it set right now to just a mock AFC that will run a few tests against for uh, demonstration purposes. And then you also have the options for which client authentication it may need, and then those options for client certificates and also custom methods like bearer tokens. Um, and then one final thing, looking at tests to run, I mentioned uh, you can change this Python function to return a specific list of files if you want. These are the tests we'll do a brief demonstration with. Um, if you wanted to run all of them, you could just leave this with all here and it would execute all of the tests. Um, and so with that, I think we're ready to actually run the test. So Right now, I'm in the root folder that you download from the repository. You need to make sure you're actually in the harness directory when you execute everything for the code to be able to find all of the other modules and things like that. And then to execute it, again, simply Python and then test, test underscore main.py is the file you want. 
And if you want to swap out those configs, you have harness config, you can point to some other test or, or some other config file or SUT config, same thing with that. Uh, we're just going to run it with sort of the defaults that I've edited um, as I was showing. So if we hit enter, we run the tests and we get generally kind of what we're expecting to see from earlier. So here at the end, sort of your first place you want to go is you have the summary. So of those six tests we ran, five got an expected result. And in this case, one had an unexpected result. Um, before we take a closer look at that, I'll pop up to the top here and we'll see in initial setup, it does log specifically what configuration files it used, what things it has pulled out from those that are maybe overriding the default options in the harness code itself. And then a list of the tests that will get run. And so for generally what you would expect in the console output for a test where everything goes well, you'll see the response task or response mask matches the format that's expected. The request matches the format that it expects. It sends it off to the AFC, gets a response that looks valid and then checks the response against the mask. And if everything looks good here, we get an expected result. Um, coming down here to the URS.4 test case, here's an instance where I mentioned sometimes warnings don't necessarily mean anything you have to be concerned about. So the URS test cases are those where it's expected that we want to get an error response from the AFC because there's something wrong with the inquiry in some fashion. So in this case, the harness recognizes, hey, these fields are missing from the inquiry that should have been there. Um, in that case, it checks and makes sure that the response mask thinks that there should be an error that comes back from the AFC. So when it sees that, it decides to proceed with the test. If that wasn't the case, it would halt the test there and say, hey, this inquiry doesn't look right. I'm going to stop before something weird happens later on. And then we see, in this case, yeah, the response we get meets the mask and everything passes. Um, the last test, URS7, is an instance where I believe the issue with the inquiry is that it's outside of the expected geographic region. So my mock AFC isn't doing any sorts of validation on that. And so we end up in an instance where we have an error. So my mock AFC has done something that was unexpected. And in this case, we see it sent a response code that the mask wasn't allowing. So we sent a, su a success response, but we expected either a general failure or um, whichever error code 103 is. I think it's unexpected value or something. I don't remember the exact error codes. Um, we'll also see that the harness doesn't stop as soon as it finds one error. It tries to log everything that ends up being wrong. So since I had a success field, I had provided availability information on a frequency and channel info basis, but the mask didn't have those fields. So it also says, hey, this was also wrong with the response. And then for some test vectors that have multiple requests in them, the harness will go ahead and call out specifically which request ID had an issue, and then finally the actual result for that test. Um, so from there, that's what you'll get from the console output for the more specific log information. Again, in the logs folder, we'll see we have a log file for each of those tests that was just run, as well as the harness underscore main.log. So again, this is just essentially a much more detailed version of what we got to the console. Um, again, that initial setup shows up here, but then we start to see some of those debug messages I mentioned. So it says, hey, we're actually starting this test. We've loaded this specific file. Here's what was in that file for us to work with. Um, if I skip down past some of this a little bit, um, we'll import uh, the response mask file as well, uh, or import the inquiry, parse that, everything looks good, send it off, we get the response back and we see the raw response that our mock AFC returned. And then we'll also see now that not only does the harness log issues where something went wrong, but it will also say, hey, I checked and the request ID matched what the mask had. So we also see the results of specifically what things it checked that also match the expected result, not only what went wrong. So you can be sure that the harness is doing a thorough job in the comparisons that it's running. And then at the end of this file, I mentioned just before the kind of summary results of how many hit each different result type, we also have the list of specifically these tests were an expected result, this specific test was an unexpected result. Um, so the last two things I want to show is the specific test 
the log file for each test um, is mostly just a duplicate from the harness underscore main broken out by test. And so that can maybe be, if you're going back and forth with an AFC who's being tested or something, and you've got one test that's going weird, you can show maybe one log file or something rather than dig it out of the whole harness underscore main. And then the responses folder has those raw responses you got back from the AFC as well. In case you want it just as a JSON file, you can easily import and do any extra investigations on. Um, so I think that covers everything I have for the live demo. Um, before I give the screen back, Lee, do you have any questions from folks where maybe I need to show something off here? I don't think so specifically. I did get one question. Um, are you uh, planning an upgrade to this to add a web GUI or is everything going to remain sort of command line uh, console based? Uh, everything's going to remain sort of this command line console based. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is just because the harness needs local access to those test vectors. So if somebody's wanting to run additional stuff, something like that would be a little bit more difficult to also provide all of the vector files you want to run through it. Um, so I think at the moment we're just planning on sticking with this, this version of the harness. Okay, I think that makes sense. Uh, the, no other questions have come in right now um, uh, specific to the test demo. So um, you want to switch back? Sure. Yep, that would be great. Okay. Okay, in theory, you guys are seeing my screen again. Is that correct? Uh, yes. If you want to go to the next slide, I believe it's the last slide that I have. Okay. Yeah, so basically, that's all I have to talk about from a test harness perspective. If you run into issues or questions, um, you're welcome to review the documentation or maybe check back in with this webinar, or if you find something that we haven't covered, you're welcome to open issues at the, the GitHub repository itself. We do monitor those and um, keep track of things. Anything that we change internally within the test harness as well, we log issues for those as we're changing them and then open pull requests. So anything like that is also um, able to be tracked there. So uh, if there's any other questions not related to the, the demo or something, I'm happy to take those now. Otherwise, that's what I've got. So we did have one question. Uh, does GitHub have uh, detailed descriptions for the test harness and test vector files? Um, or are you relying upon the Wi-Fi Alliance documents for those? Yeah, we're relying on the, the Wi-Fi Alliance documents for those. We don't have any documentation on specifically what the different test vectors are trying to do, but the names do correspond with um, anything that you find from the Wi-Fi Alliance's publications. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else specific to this? Nope, that's it. So um, with that, uh, thank you, uh, Austin and Andy. And uh, I'll just go to the last slide here uh, and ask all the panelists to come back uh, if they're, uh, or to turn their microphones on. And I'll go through some of the general questions we've got. We've got about uh, three minutes left, so I'll, I can, I think I can get a couple of questions. Uh, we've included here a list of important links. So if you want to find the Wi-Fi line specifications, it's at wifi.org slash file slash AFC specification and test plans. Uh, the WinForm specifications are at 6 gigahertz.wireliftsinnovation.org slash baseline standards. Uh, the test harness is uh, in GitHub at the link that we showed earlier. And then there's a number of supplemental databases. Um, the, the main, uh, the, the snapshots for everything that we'll be using in testing are shown here. And so if there's no questions on that, I will go back and do some of the questions that we received. Yeah, I'm sorry, you can, you can add the, the traceability matrix later on to this page when you share this with the public. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, it, that's under the uh, WinForm documents. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to find the traceability matrix, uh, it's, uh, I believe it's also located here, but I will confirm that. Okay. Um, so let me just make a note. Okay. Um, 
so a couple of other questions that came in um, and it looks like we have time for maybe one so I'll pick um, so a question about proxy use does the AFC system have to include a response to all messages that were in the request from the proxy Uh, maybe I can handle that one, I guess, from the protocol side. Yeah, the um, AFC system is expected to provide a response to each of the requests which were kind of bundled in the in, in the single request message. Okay. Um, what are acceptable methods for location? What This one may be beyond this webinar. Uh, for indoor AP, what are the methods for location that are acceptable? Uh, maybe that's one you guys want to follow up with offline? Sure. Okay. Uh, are there a max number of requests and response attempts uh, allowed and uh, for the AFC device to register with the AFC system? And uh, if so, what happens if they exceed that max number? Um, yeah, maybe trying to handle that one. So the the, the specification does not. Um, does not hard code any limits for a number of requests. It is possible that an AFC system could be overloaded, in which case it may you know, respond saying it's unable to process it at, at that time. The behavior of the device to retry in what cadence is, is not defined in the specification. So that's something that you know vendors could put information in, into specific um, extensions, for example, on uh, when retries and so on are expected. Obviously, if a, if a device does not retry or does not get a response in time and its previous grant has expired, then it, it can't use those channels until it gets a, um, uh, a new valid response. So I can add there, Lee, that the, the, the requirement is that a device communicates with the AFC once every 24 hours. Uh, there, is no, there is no need, there is no requirement to do that faster than that. There is no concept of heartbeat. There is no concept of a grant here, unlike CBRS. So uh, basically, once every 24 hours is uh, is enough from a regulatory perspective. I think the rest of that is uh, how the AFC is managed if if there is a uh, there is a bombardment of the messages from the devices. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, with that, I think um, we have sort of exceeded the time that we allocated for the webinar. So we'll uh, we'll close here. I want to thank all the panelists uh, for their presentations. Um, I've gotten a lot of comments uh, that this has been very useful for a lot of people. So thank you very much for uh, for your time and effort in, in pulling this together and presenting. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, the slides will be available later today and you will be able to find them uh, at, uh, whoops, let me go all the way up here. Uh, you'll be able to find the slides at wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars, and I believe a copy would also be sent out to everyone who attended, and then the recorded webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, and again, I, I think a link for the specific one will be sent out to everyone who attended. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, I think we will uh, call the, uh, draw the webinar to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.